Good morning, and welcome to the Polaris Industries fourth quarter and full year 2019 earnings conference call. All participants will be in listen-only mode. Should you need assistance, please signal a conference specialist by pressing the star key followed by zero. After today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. To ask a question, you may press star then one on your touchtone phone. To withdraw your question, please press star then two. Please note, this event is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to Richard Edwards, Vice President of Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thank you, Gary, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our 2019 fourth quarter and full year earnings call. A slide presentation is accessible at our website at ir.polaris.com, which has additional information for this morning's call. Scott Wine, our Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, and Mike Speetson, our Chief Financial Officer, will have remarks summarizing the quarter and full year expectations, and then we'll take some questions. During the call, we will be discussing various topics which should be considered forward-looking for the purposes of the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. Actual results could differ materially from those projections in the forward-looking statements. You can refer to our 2018 10-K for additional details regarding these risks and uncertainties. <clears throat> All references to the fourth quarter and full year 2019 actual results and our 2020 guidance are reported on an adjusted non-GAAP basis unless otherwise noted. Please refer to our Reg G reconciliation schedules at the end of the presentation for the GAAP to non-GAAP adjustments. Now I'll turn it over to our CEO, Scott Wine. Scott. Thanks, Richard. Good morning, and thank you for joining us. While we were battling in December to close the year strong, I made time to see Navy football beat Army and then win the Liberty Bowl to finish the season 11-2. and two. Their recovery from 2018's 3-8 and eight record served as a good reminder of what can happen with a motivated team, experienced coaches, and a good game plan. Of course, winning also demands execution, and Coach Niamatololo had that dialed in all year long. While I would grade our Polaris performance last year a good bit better than 3-8, and eight, we share Navy's strong foundation and focus on execution, and I like our chances to make a Navy football-like improvement in 2020. Retail and revenue growth in Q4 helped push full-year sales up 12%, with half of that from organic growth and the remainder from our first full year with boats. Encouragingly, we had positive sales growth in every business segment during the quarter and for the full year, a true testament to our strategy and the execution of our Polaris team. We made bold price moves in 2019, which aided our top line, but at times challenged us competitively. Providing our best ever delivery performance and offering customer advantages through factory choice, our flexible and efficient operations were a key advantage that we will continue to exploit. With lean activities continuing to drive network-wide productivity and strategic sourcing savings beginning to hit the bottom line, we delivered better than anticipated <clears throat> gross margin performance to finish the year. Our Power Sports PG&A and related aftermarket brands exceeded $1 billion in annual sales for the first time, which is an especially significant milestone for one of our most important and profitable parts of our business. Cap's four-wheel part business retail aspects also had another strong quarter of growth, up 11% over the prior year period. I am proud of the work our team did last year to limit the impact of tariffs, and with exemptions flowing through and mitigation efforts accelerating, we will moderately reduce our tariff burden in 2020. Indian Motorcycles had two major product introductions last year, with the FTR 1200 in the first half and Challenger arriving towards the end of October. Both contributed to Q4 and full-year market share gains, and we expect their sales to remain strong this year. Overall, fourth quarter North American retail sales were up 2%, improving sequentially as ongoing side-by-side -side growth was complemented by growth in ATVs and snow. We lagged the ORV market slightly, which was up mid-single digits in the quarter, but with the improvement built into our 2020 plans, we do not expect that to continue. Indian retail returned to growth and market share gains in the fourth quarter, outperforming a North American heavyweight market, which was down for the quarter and year. Boat retail was up modestly with Bennington leading the way, keeping pace with the industry that was up mid-single digits in its seasonally smallest quarter. For the year, Bennington gained market share and our dealer inventory reduction finished slightly ahead of plan. Our model year 20 side-by-side -side retail ramped slowly, slightly below our expectations, but improved in December 
and appropriate countermeasures are in place to ensure that we satisfy many more customers in the year ahead. Snow sales have been strong, and with the help of a good start to winter snow and an impressive lineup of sleds, and we know this is about to get better with our dealer show next month. We ended the year with North American dealer inventory up 5%, which is at the, which is at the higher end of our comfort zone, but certainly manageable as we head into the spring selling season. We are lowering our dealer retail flow management profiles for 2020 and expect to maintain our inventory turnover advantage in the industry. Snow inventory contributed a 1% improvement, reflecting the solid snow conditions and strong demand for 850-powered sleds. We made several key leadership moves recently, and I'm excited about their positive impact. Steve Minetto has expertly led our motorcycle business for the past decade, building the Indian brand and business into a half-billion-dollar global enterprise, boasting industry-leading growth and customer satisfaction. Having grown up in his family's Polaris dealership and led sales for off-road vehicles, Steve's knowledge, passion, and relentless focus on results are timely additions to our largest business unit. Mike Doherty is another 20-plus year Polaris leader, having led our ATV business and significantly expanded our global reach during his international tenure. Mike led the growth of Indian in Europe and Asia and was intimately involved in the development and launch of the FTR 1200. Now leading both motorcycles and international, Mike's business acumen, bold thinking, and global brand management experience should enable us to accelerate the work that Steve started. These moves position us well to win the competitive battle in power sports. Strategic growth is also extremely important, and with Chris Musso's two years leading ORV and nearly 20 years of world-class consulting experience, he is the right person to consolidate our strategy and accelerate our investments in growth with electric powertrains. We have extensive experience and a few products in our electric portfolio, and we are committed to being competitive and profitable in our electric endeavors. I'm extremely proud of the digital tools and advances our team has made to improve how our customers experience our vehicles and our company. But we must accelerate this transformation to enable the continued expansion of our business and customer-centric digital engagement. And to facilitate that, I am thrilled that Vic Kolsch has joined us as Polaris' first Chief Digital Officer. Vic's experience as CEO of Exide Technologies and his groundbreaking and very relevant work as Chief Digital Officer at Michelin Group <clears throat> gives him the tools and a background to take Polaris to another level of digital engagement and execution. We are excited to have him and look forward to seeing how much he improves both the customer experience and our overall business. Our commitment to innovation is a key reason Polaris exists, and our history of high-performing industry-leading vehicles testifies to its efficacy. We remain dedicated to innovation, but consistent with our Think Outside brand message, we are extending our reach in exciting ways, such as Factory Choice's unique vehicle offering, Camp Razor's amazingly fun and large annual customer appreciation party, and Polaris Adventures experienced roughly 130,000 visitors last year. Our focus on customers plainly shows in our investments, exemplified by our recent ride command enhancements that enables buddy tracking, AI-enhanced factory defect detection in our plants to improve quality, and our new $50 million distribution facility in Nevada, which offers expedited deliveries to our West Coast customers. Our Las Vegas reveal of the 2020 slingshot was fun and exciting, which mirrors how we expect a much larger audience of customers to feel as they experience its new automated manual transmission. Auto Drive will capture most of the headlines, but with 70% new content, including a more powerful, higher revving ProStar engine, significant interior enhancements, and eye-catching LED lighting, the 2020 slingshot's allure extends far beyond those who simply do not want to drive a stick. The phenomenal Indian Challenger also boasts a brand new liquid-cooled engine, giving it best-in-class horsepower to go with its classic styling and cutting-edge electronics. It is aptly named as it invites the riders to see what's around the next bend and dares our industry rivals to keep up. With a dynamic market, a charged political landscape, and our positive leadership changes, a consistent, stable strategy is paramount to our success. Our commitment to being a customer-centric, highly efficient growth company is unwavering, and despite the unanticipated tariffs we are working to overcome, we remain focused on creating a path to our 2022 financial targets. I will now turn it over to our Chief Financial Officer, Mike Speetson, who will update you on our financial results and plans. Thanks, Scott, and good morning, everyone. Our fourth quarter sales were up 7% on a gap and adjusted basis versus the prior year, 
driven by higher sales of off-road vehicles and motorcycles. Average selling price was up 8% during the quarter, driven by the mix of products, both in off-road vehicles and motorcycles, continuing a trend we've seen throughout 2019. Fourth quarter earnings per share on a gap basis was $1.58. Adjusted earnings per share was $1.83, flat with last year's fourth quarter. The 2019 fourth quarter included approximately an incremental $0.06 per share of tariff and foreign exchange headwind, along with increased promotions and warranty costs which was offset by increased volume and mix, manufacturing efficiency, and a lower tax rate. For the full year 2019, sales were up 12% on a gap and adjusted basis versus the prior year. All segments grew for the year on a gap and adjusted basis. Full year earnings per share on a gap basis was $5.20. Adjusted earnings per share was $6.32, which was in line with our expectations. The full year EPS included negative impact of tariff and foreign exchange as well as continued investment in strategic initiatives, which was somewhat offset by a combination of increased volume, operational improvements, a lower tax rate, and lower share count. Gross profit margins on a gap and adjusted basis increased 40 basis points for the fourth quarter, driven by favorable product mix and operating leverage, which was somewhat offset by tariffs, foreign exchange, and higher warranty expense. We've provided more detail on gross profit margin performance for 2019 in the supplemental section of this presentation. Turning to our segment performance, ORV slash snowmobile segment sales were up 7% in Q4, driven by ORV whole goods sales and PG&A. ORV whole goods sales were driven by increased unit sales, as well as a heavier mix of side-by-side -side sales, which drove average selling prices up by 10%. For the full year, ORV slash snowmobile segment sales were up 7%, driven by all categories. Motorcycle sales increased 37% on a gap basis and 38% on an adjusted basis in the fourth quarter. Increased Indian motorcycle sales, primarily in the heavyweight category, were driven by the introduction of the Challenger. Full-year motorcycle sales increased 7% on a gap and adjusted basis driven by the introduction of the FTR and Challenger bikes, partially offset by lower slingshot sales in anticipation of the new model introduction. Global adjacent market sales decreased 1% in the fourth quarter. Lower sales in our commercial, government, and defense business were the key drivers. For the full year, global adjacent market sales increased 4%. Aftermarket sales were up 4% in the fourth quarter, with both TAP and our other aftermarket brands increasing sales during the quarter. TAP sales were up 1%, and our other aftermarket brands grew sales by 22% in Q4. The strong performance in our other aftermarket brands was driven primarily by snow-related sales. Full year aftermarket sales were up 2% over last year. Our boat segment sales were down 7% for the quarter as we sought to protect dealer inventory levels given poor weather conditions in 2019. Full year boat sales were up over 100% given we completed the acquisition mid-year 2018. Organically, sales were down slightly. International and PG&A sales are embedded within our segments. Our international sales were down 1% for the fourth quarter, up 2% on a constant currency basis. Declines in MEA and Latin America were mostly offset by growth in Asia Pacific and sales where sales were up 17%. Full year international sales were up 4% versus 2018 and up 9% on a constant currency basis. <clears throat> Our parts, garments, and accessory sales increased 7% during the quarter and 9% for the full year. Now let me switch gears and move on to our guidance for 2020. Our guidance for the full year 2020 is as follows. Total company sales are expected to be up in the range of 2 to 4% versus 2019. The 2020 sales growth includes the following assumptions. The overall power sports market is expected to grow at a similar rate to last year in the low single digits percent range with the off-road vehicle market growing, particularly side-by-sides, and the motorcycle market continuing to decline. Lastly, the pontoon market is expected to grow in the low single digits. We anticipate average selling prices will continue to be positive, although not as high as 2019, given we took a 3.5% price, price increase in January of 2019, which will not repeat in 2020. In fact, you will recall that earlier this month, we took price reductions on a few of our razors to be more in line with competitive pricing on comparable models. Remember, this is an MSRP pricing adjustment, and we anticipate lower promotional spend to offset the lower price levels. Adjusted earnings per share for 2020 is expected to be in the range of $6.80 to $7.05 compared to the full year 2019 adjusted EPS of $6.32, an increase of 8 to 
Moving down the P&L, our 2020 earnings per share guidance assumes the following. We anticipate that adjusted gross profit margins will be up 40 to 70 basis points due to ongoing operational improvements and lower promotional costs. A portion of the improvement is driven by our plan to repurpose purpose some of our promotional dollars in ORV, which are reported as contra sales, and the selling and marketing expense, which are reported in operating expenses. While tariff costs remain an ongoing issue, we have made great strides in our mitigation efforts, as well as success around exemptions. Tariff costs in 2020 is anticipated to be down slightly from 2019. Our guidance assume for the, assumes the following related to tariffs. China 301 list 3 tariff remains at 25%. List 4A remains at 7.5%. No change to the retaliatory tariff is contemplated, and we've included in our guidance the impact of all exemptions we received to date, which equal approximately 10 million, as well as the anticipated recovery of past tariffs paid for these exempted items which totals just over $10 million. Adjusted operating expenses are expected to improve slightly as a percent of sales down 10 to 20 basis points in 2020, which includes the increase in selling marketing expense I referred to earlier. Our R&D expense is essentially flat versus 2019 as we continue to execute efficiency programs to enable us to more effectively execute programs. Income from financial services is expected to be about flat with last year. Retail financing availability remains at acceptable levels, with the penetration rate expected to be in the mid-30% range, while dealer inventory turns are expected to improve, which is anticipated to lower the income from the Polaris Acceptance Joint Venture. Interest expense will continue to decline as our focus on using excess cash flow to reduce debt levels remains a priority in the near term. Interest expense is expected to decline in the low teens percentage range for the year. The income tax rate is expected to be approximately 22% for the full year 2020. Share count is expected to be up 2 to 3% with minimal buybacks of our stock contemplated at this time. Lastly, while currency is expected to ne negatively impact 2020 pre-tax profit, the incremental impact is significantly smaller than in past years. We anticipate the currency will be a headwind by about $8 million to pre-tax profit, largely due to the Canadian dollar and euro. We've planned 2020 assuming the average euro to USD at $1.10 and the CAD to USD at $0.75. Cents. As it relates to Q1 of 2020, we anticipate Q1 sales to be about flat compared to 2019, and gross profit margins are expected to be down approximately 150 to 200 basis points in the first quarter given the mix of products ships, shipped, specifically lower high-margin side-by-side sales and higher motorcycle sales, which carry a lower gross margin. Additionally, Q1 operating expenses will be at levels similar to Q4 of 2019, which is essentially the run rate level of cost we exited 2019 at. The result of all these moving pieces is that our expected 2020 first quarter earnings per share will be slightly more than half of our 2019 first quarter EPS results of $1.08 per share. Now let me provide a little bit more detail on our sales guidance for our segments. ORV slash snowmobile sales are expected to be up in the low single digits percent, with snow up mid single digits percent and ORV sales up low single digits percent. Improvement will be driven by new products and improved retail execution. Motorcycle sales are anticipated to be up in the low double digit percent range driven by new products. Global adjacent market sales are expected to be up high single digits percent with growth expected in all product lines. Aftermarket segment sales are expected to be up low to mid single digits percent with improved growth expected from TAP. Our boat segment sales are expected to be up about flat, be about flat to last year. PG&A sales, which are embedded within our segments, are expected to increase in the high single digits percent range. On a gross margin segment reporting basis, we expect all segments' gross profit margins to improve over 2019 on a comparable basis. Please see the supplemental section in the presentation for additional details. Operating cash flow finished 2019 at 655 million, up 37%, driven primarily by improved working capital. We anticipate 2020 operating cash flow will be at similar levels to 2019. Our capital deployment framework remains unchanged. Capital expenditures are expected to be at similar levels to 2019 at approximately 250 million which includes tooling required to support the supply chain transformation program. Our debt to total capital ratio of 60% is down from 2018's ratio of 69% as anticipated, and we expect to drive this ratio lower in 2020. 
Subject to the board's approval, 2020 will become our 25th year of a consistently increasing dividend to shareholders, which is termed a dividend aristocrat. The terminology initially referred to S&P 500 companies with long dividend track records, but more recently has been applied universally to various size companies with such a long history of increasing dividends. An exclusive club will be very proud to be associated with. Our share repurchases were minimal in 2019 given our focus on debt reduction. We have approximately 3.2 million shares remaining under the current board authorization, but we do not anticipate significant share repurchases in 2020 given our desire to reduce the debt level. With that, I'll turn it back over to Scott for some final thoughts. Thanks, Mike. The resiliency of both the consumer and the broader economy remains a tailwind for the power sports industry, and our 2020 plan anticipates those trends continuing. Recession risk is likely to rise throughout the year, and we will remain vigilant and ready with our contingency plans. Agility is key to navigating evolving market and competitive landscape, and our deployment of lean tools drives us to simplify our product lineup while accelerating product innovation and introductions. Across the portfolio, expect us to be a more nimble and aggressive competitor. Strategic sourcing is gaining momentum and remains on track to be the most impactful productivity initiative ever undertaken at Polaris. Coupled with more efficient and accurately targeted promo spend and our ongoing tariff mitigation initiatives, increased operating leverage will be a noteworthy driver of this year's earnings expansion. Productivity is better with growth, and our international strategy is helping to make that happen in 2020. With expectations for stronger growth in the Asia-Pacific region, our new Finnish subsidiary allowing us to go direct in all Scandinavian markets, and our Vietnam JV driving improved margins, we have built a solid foundation for global expansion in 2020 and beyond. The Phase 1 trade agreement with China prevented additional tariffs from hitting Polaris, and the more conciliatory tone in the negotiations provides confidence that progress will continue. Our exemption requests are beginning to appear, and we are extremely pleased to have a lower overall year-over-year tariff impact in 2020. Our overarching goal of being a customer-centric, highly efficient growth company drives everything we do and governs our plans for the future. Investments in digital will continue to engage and delight customers, giving Polaris products another means of differentiating themselves from the competition. Consolidating our electrification efforts will accelerate the process of delivering innovative, profitable vehicles to win in a rapidly changing power sports environment. And with a continued emphasis on safety and quality, coupled with design to value, we will deliver the product quality and margin expansion our customers and shareholders demand and deserve. The future remains bright, and I am confident in our team and our strategy as we lead the power sports industry into a new decade. With that, I'll turn it over to Gary to open the line for questions. We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star then one on your touchtone phone. If you are using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. To withdraw your question, please press star then two. Please limit your questions to one with a single follow-up. At this time, we will pause momentarily to assemble our roster. The first question is from Greg Badishkanian with City. Please go ahead. Great, thanks. Um, you know, first question, just uh, broadly speaking, you're expecting the power sports market to increase uh, low single digit in 2020. Um, I'm just wondering what what you're expecting from a sort of a macro uh, environment, and then I have one uh, follow-up to that. Well, the macro environment, you know, we still expect uh, GDP is going to be in that two to three range, and, uh, you know, the Fed continues to be very aggressive, and that uh, tends to help, you know, markets and consumer sentiment as well. So, you know, we think the, the overall power sports industry remains healthy, um, but, you know, we're coming off a reasonably good year, and, and we believe that that low single-digit growth is, 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 is good for, uh, for us in the industry. Okay. Uh, and then um, specifically on ATVs, because you saw a really nice improvement there uh, in 4Q is up like mid-single-digit versus the trend of down mid-single-digit. Um, so maybe just um, talk a little bit about that, that segment and, and what led to the uh, improvement um, there. Yeah, you know we are still proud to be the uh, the number one player in ATVs in the global market. But you know we did lose some share last year. It is the most price sensitive um, part of the market that we play in, and you know we probably took more risk there with our price increases last year. And 
I think throughout the year we learned from that. We made adjustments, and um, I think we exited the year feeling comfortable that we know how to be very competitive um, and still make good money um, in, in the ATV market. I mean, the sportsman ATV, the innovation continues to be strong. Um, we, we like that aspect of the business. It's just it's, it's not growing at the same rate as side-by-sides, which is where we put a little more emphasis. But, you know, we don't lose sight that we need to remain competitive in that um, price-sensitive market. Yeah, all right. Thank you. The next question is from Jamie Katz with Morningstar. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. I think I heard you guys say that the pontoon industry was expected to be up low single, at a low single-digit rate this quarter, um, but you guys have about flat um, for sales, and I think Marine Max put out some pretty interesting numbers last week, so I'm curious if you can sort of reconcile the current cadence of demand with the slowing market share gains. Yeah, so we, um, I guess a couple of things, Jamie. One, the the uh, low single digits for the pontoon was for all of 2020. Um, Bennington continued to gain share last year, and as I said in my prepared remarks, you know, we're uh, protecting dealer inventory. Uh, we think we're in a, in a good spot, but uh, similar to what we're doing with side-by-sides in the first quarter is we're making sure that we're not shipping ahead of uh, schedule. Um, you know, it's to be seen in terms of how the weather will work out as we get into 2020, but you know, we think we're going to position ourselves to be in a good spot with the dealers having the right level of inventory. And um, if the market ends up better, we're in a position to be able to ratchet up if we need to. And and if the market's not quite as good, we've got dealer inventory in a good spot. Okay. And then can you comment on what gives you guys some confidence that some of these issues in the global adjacent markets category um, begin to alleviate? I think there were a couple different factors you pointed out to for weakness now um, because it looks like we have that um, or you guys have that picking up pretty significantly last year. And with respect to that, what are you seeing for the European products uh, as far as demand is concerned, things like uh, Axum and Goopil? Thanks. I don't think we've underperformed nearly to the degree you're referring to, Jamie, but I will tell you we're, um, we've made good product moves and leadership moves in our uh, global adjacent market. You know, uh, Philippe continues to do – very well at, at Exum, and uh, you know, they're continuing to do uh, take share in that duopoly, and uh, we, you know we feel good about the outlook for that business. Our Goupil business and their partnership with Picnic continues to serve us well, and uh, we've got good you know electric products continuing to flow into that market. And you know as we consolidated production of um, Jim and Taylor Dunn last year, we started to see the the benefits of that move uh, later in the year. So you know obviously the um, the Polaris. <coughs> Uh, government and um, military sales uh, has it's a bit of a lumpy business, but you know we like where we're positioned there. So overall, global adjacent markets is um, solid and, and got a good outlook. Okay, next question. The next question is from Craig Kennison with Robert W. Baird. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning. Thanks for taking my question. I think. Uh, well, the question's on RFM, and I think you had mentioned early in the call that you plan to lower stocking profiles. What motivated that decision uh, to lower profiles? You know, we, uh, as I also pointed out on the call, our, our turns are better than anybody else in the industry, so we're feeling good about that. What part of our RFM plan is a regular ongoing dialogue with our dealers And um, as we did that, we just realized there were certain models, as we are improving our delivery performance, that they don't need as much stock up. So part of what you're seeing is just a reflection of how much better our delivery performance is getting. Um, Really nothing more than that. And then sort of on a related note, with respect to the side-by-side market, maybe walk through the priorities for Steve Minetto as he takes over there. Is it it product? Is it dealer relations? You know, supply chain, market share? What's the mandate there? You know, I mean, the mandate is pretty simple, Uh, market share gains and profitable growth. And um, I really don't know that there's anybody in the world that I have more confidence in to be able to deliver that in our off-road vehicle business. You know, Chris uh, Musso did a nice job, and um, I think Steve Minetto comes in with just tremendously relevant and experience. And, um, you know, internally I call it a glass-eating focus because, I mean, he really has a relentless focus on results. You saw that in Indian and um, and already he's making a positive impact. So I, I think really it's retail execution, market share gains, and profitable growth is, is what we expect. And, you know, I, I said in my prepared remarks, 
not only did Indian become a half billion dollar business pretty quickly, when he left the business, had the highest customer satisfaction scores in the industry. So I think dealer and customer satisfaction will also um, improve. And just really the, the execution of our sales force, I think uh, you'll see a, a market improvement there. Thank you. I could go on. <laughs> <laughs> the, next, the next question is from Scott Stember with C.L. King. Please go ahead. Uh, good morning, and thanks for taking my questions. Morning. Morning. Uh, Mike, just talking about the first quarter guidance, did I hear correct that at the end of the day we're talking about half of what we did in the first quarter of last year? And maybe if that was true, just walk through again some of the mechanics behind that. Yeah, so it's it's probably just a, a little better than half. Um, you know, I think it really comes down to, to mix is playing a big factor. Um, you know, we're, we're essentially, it's typically a pretty low quarter from a side-by-side -side shipment perspective. Uh, and we're dialing that back given what Scott referenced in terms of RFM as well as just making sure that we protect um, where, we see, where we see dealer inventory. Uh, but we are ramping pretty heavily from a motorcycle standpoint. Um, you can imagine with the new slingshot out as well as the success we've seen with Challenger, uh, that gives us a little bit of a mixed challenge from a GP standpoint. And then although we're not increasing uh, our operating expenses substantially year over year, the run rate we left Q4 uh, when you add that to the mix headwind that we're uh, contending with is is really the challenge. But, um, you know, look, we'll, we'll push the team hard to make sure that we, you know, drive that uh, performance in Q1, and uh, we think it's going to position us really well given the work that Steve and team are doing around uh, retail execution within ORV. And uh, last, just on, on tariffs, looks like you, you guys have had uh, some good success with uh, getting some exemptions and I think you said that there was some retroactives in there as well. Maybe just give us, can you give us a, a feeling for, you know, the level that you think that, that still could come or benefits that could come next year? You know, we've made good progress. Um, I'm really proud of the work that our team has done um, on all aspects, Tara. So, you know, remember it's, it's both mitigation and an exemption request. And I think for most of the year, exemptions um, lagged the mitigation efforts towards the end of the year. You know, as I talked about on the uh, the third quarter call, we were starting to feel more confident, and that is starting to flow through. Given how the that part of the government works, I'm not about to guesstimate um, what else can happen from here. But we're pleased with where we are now, and uh, we don't expect it to to get worse throughout the year. So that gives us a level of comfort uh, going forward. And Scott, just I mean, just to put some of the numbers in perspective, because um, we didn't spend a lot of time in the call talking about it. You know, we ended 2019 with tariffs being around $90 million. So that's obviously came in lower than we were expecting. Part of that is, you know, we had lower volume in fourth quarter um, than we were uh, originally anticipating. But given, you know, where phase one deal was shaking out, as well as the continued effort by the organization to push uh, tariff mitigation, we were able to drive that number down. And then, as I referenced in my prepared remarks, uh, tariffs will be down slightly year over year. And that includes the exemptions as well as the recovery. Um, the recovery process is, is a bit cumbersome. We, uh, we essentially have to gather up everything that we've paid and then essentially submit that to customs. And so we're, we're trying to figure out the exact timing of that. We're assuming that the majority of that will happen in the first half in terms of the way we've got our guidance built. Um, but as Scott indicated, the government can be a little bit fickled on this and, and uh, the exemption process is still relatively new. So. We've got as much as we know built in there, and uh, I think the key message is that we're managing what we can manage, and we've driven the number down year over year. Got it. That's all I have. Thanks. The next question is from Robin Farley with UBS. Please go ahead. Um, thanks. I, I was going to ask on the um, tariff situation as well, and I know you got some exemptions late in the year, but it's still obviously a significant amount of tariffs that you're paying. I guess how much longer would would you be – fine paying that um, 90 million a year uh, before you would say, you know, let's move production to Mexico so that we're competitively on, on the same ground that, um, that, that other manufacturers are. Hey, let me be clear. We're not fine playing $90 million. I mean, we, we accept it and we can deal with it. And, um, you know, the fact that it's not increasing year over year gives us, you know, operating leverage that we're Pleased with, um, you know, we are constantly evaluating uh, where we manufacture and what makes sense for our customers and our employees and our shareholders. Um, and I tell you right now, what's baked into our plan is that we will continue to assemble vehicles uh, where they are. 
And, um, you know, our expectation is we're going to see continued improvement in the tariff environment, and, um, you know, we'll continue to evaluate if, if that doesn't um, become the case. But right now, we've got a, a reasonable plan baked in, and I think, you know, 8 to 12 percent earnings guidance um, in spite of the significant tariffs is pretty darn good. Okay. Um, and then just um, one follow-up on the comments about um, Q1. Just to clarify, you talked about the margin impact because of lower mix of, of side-by-side. Um, but I just want to clarify, it's, uh, you're, you're also talking about, because of the RFM adjustments, actual lower side-by-side unit shipments in Q1, right? Not just lower mix, but actually, in, you know, in absolute terms, lower year-over-year as well. just want to clarify that because I think there was just some confusion about that. Thanks. Um, yeah, there would be lower side-by-side sh- sales shipments. Okay, thank you. The next question is from Michael Swartz with SunTrust Robinson Humphrey. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning, guys. Uh, Mike, just clarification. I think in your statement you mentioned that um, – Maybe just want to make sure I heard this right. In the quarter side by side, ASPs were up ten percent, or were you talking about overall ORV? Uh, overall ORV was up ten percent, but it's clearly being driven by side by side. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, and, and then just with the um, with the the uh, sorry <laughs> the twenty two percent growth in in core. Uh, Aftermarket sales this quarter, I may have missed it. What what was behind that? And then, did you did you say what your outlook was for whole whole good revenue uh, growth for 2020 in ORV? Yeah, we we didn't talk whole good growth. Um, you know, we obviously talked about what our uh, segment sales margin growth uh, is, and we talked about the low to uh, low to mid singles for ORV. Uh, and obviously with PG&A being up, that, that can give you a sense that the unit sales are probably towards the, the low end. Um, for aftermarket, the growth in the non-TAP portion was really driven by snow sales, snow-related sales. We saw really good performance, you know, everywhere from the Midwest to the mountains, and so that really drove, you know, the climb uh, and 509 sales uh, in that business. The piece that we didn't mention is, you know, TAP was up, uh, which was good, the retail side of TAP was up anywhere from mid to high single digits. And so we continue to see really good performance there and uh, more contraction, more on the wholesale, which tends to be the lower margin side of the business. And, you know, that's more intentional than it is uh, unintentional. Okay, great. Thank you. The next question is from James Hardiman with Wedbush Securities. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. Um, I just wanted to make sure I understood uh, a couple of things that you've said. So, ORV ASP was up 10% in the quarter. Um, help me sort of connect the dots between that and ATVs were actually uh, stronger than side-by-sides. Uh, sounds like you're saying mix was a positive, but at least there that mix is a negative. So, what's the other type of mix that's driving such a big ASP well, increase? Yeah, so I mean, the thing you got to think through is we have a pretty high attachment rate from a PG&A standpoint. So when you put that against a side-by-side versus an ATV, even with ATV having a stronger retail quarter, uh, it just can't move the needle. Okay, and and I, I guess bigger picture, how do I think about that for 2020? You're basically telling us that at least in the first quarter, side-by-sides are going to be down in terms of shipments. Uh, I'm assuming that won't be the case for the year, but ultimately, as I think about a low single-digit ORV number for the year, what's how do I think about ASP in that context? Well, I mean, the, the ASP, as I mentioned in my prepared remarks, will be positive, but it's not going to be anywhere near as much. I mean, I think there was a pretty substantial mix calibration that happened um, within 2019. You know, if you have to remember that we came in pretty heavy with our factory choice uh, around our Ranger product lineup. The North Star uh, Ranger has been incredibly successful. We don't expect that to change in terms of growth year over year. You're just not going to get as much of a pop. And then when you add into that, that we had raised prices anywhere from three to three and a half percent. And we don't anticipate that being the case in 2020. In fact, we've taken some of the MSRPs down um, it'll be positive, but just nowhere near as, as much as we've seen so far. And remember, okay, the first, then, quor- the, the first yep, quarter, James, is also is that reset, if you will, of, of dealer inventory. I mean, we ended at plus five, 
And, you know, I said that's at the higher end of our comfort zone, and we're going to adjust the profile. So really, it, it's positioning us for a much better last three quarters of the year. Don't read anything more into it than that. Right. And you ultimately expect side-by-sides to continue to outpace ATVs for the year, right? Forever. Yeah. Yeah, forever. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then just to clarify on the tariff question, so if I'm hearing this right, you're, you're, uh, the, the recovered tariffs that you paid in 2019 are included in the 2020 gross profit numbers. Um, in terms of the exemptions that you've already gotten, it, I'm assuming that that's going to continue to be the case. So as we move forward here, for every exemption that you get, let's say you get another $50 million taken off, that's going to be $100 million of, of gross margin benefit. Is that, is that how to think about things? Well, I'm not going to comment on those numbers you just used because those yeah, are awfully large. The numbers, but, I, just, but I'm going to notionally, – notionally, you're correct. As, as we get exemptions, the way it works, when we're notified – our team goes through and takes a week or two to, to figure it out because it is not an easy process. There's a lot of stipulations and, and parameters in there. Once we've identified that our, our components are exempt, we take an immediate revaluation in our inventory. So that helps profit immediately for anything that we have inventoried uh, as well as shipping. And then anything that we've paid to customs, that's when we start aggregating that up and we'll put in an application and then we'll essentially get reimbursed for any of the tariff expense that we've had. It is a long and cumbersome process, both in terms of gathering the paperwork as well as the filing and getting the cash. That's where we, you know, we have very little experience. We've we've gotten some money recovered, um, and it came in the form of a lot of different checks and a very long process. So, given how much money we're talking about, uh, as I mentioned in my script, just over ten million dollars, we're going to be working aggressively to try and get that in as soon as we can. Okay, that's helpful. Thanks, guys. Um, the next question is from Joe Altobello with Raymond James. Please go ahead. Thanks. Hey, guys. Good morning. Um, so first question on strategic sourcing, uh, you guys have not quantified this in the past, but I'm curious uh, how much savings you're expecting in 2020 uh, and how much how much of a driver that's going to be uh, or is expected to be for margin expansion this year. You know, like I said, the long-term outlook for that is still the highest productivity product we've ever had. The... Um, the 2019 and 2020 numbers are significant, but it's not increasing much year over year. We exit 2020 with a very um, big and helpful number, but the process of getting there doesn't really ramp up until the second half of the year. So, um, you know, we're, it's just unhelpful to get into quantifying the exact dollar amounts because then you start to compare it year over year and whatnot. Um, but it was a good number last year. It'll be about the same amount this year, but exit on a rampy rate that's probably 3x what we'll gain this year. Yeah, and I think, Joe, the, the key component is we're still, <clears throat> we're still heavy in the investment cycle. And what I mean is, is that, as Scott indicated, the savings are on the right trajectory. We have a pretty heavy team internally that's being dedicated to this as we work through Wave 2, and there's obviously several waves of this as well as the engineering work that's associated with doing the validation around the initial parts that will go through uh, that where we're moving suppliers or changing the supply uh, base. So the, the encouraging thing is, is that the savings are on pace. Uh, it's encouraging that year over year it's adding to both gross profit and, and operating profit. Uh, and as Scott indicated, we start picking up momentum as we get into 2021. Got it. Okay. And then just uh, switching gears to the LRV leadership change, uh, back in December. I'm curious how it impacts, you know, your go-to-market strategy. I think, Scott, you started talking about this earlier, but um, it seems like the MSRP rollback, for example, on Razors was a part of that. And I guess, should we expect you guys to be more proactive on pricing promotion on the ground, uh, given that change going forward? No. Remember what I talked about, Steve, background. His family owned a dealership. He ran sales. So his his ability to listen, to understand, and then react and implement changes based on input from the field is is unparalleled. I mean, he's just really, really good at it. And um, But he's also really good at focusing on the bottom line. So I think what happens is you get a mix of, of listening to, reacting to the dealer and the sales force, but also being very protective of what we do with margins. You know, Mike talked about one of the things we're doing is actually decreasing ORV promotions a little bit and shifting some of that over 
to operating expense in, in marketing and brand messaging. And ultimately, Steve knows is if you drive that right brand awareness, um, you don't have to give us away as much as on price. So I think you're going to see just overall um, excellent execution by the, the sales force and, and team and giving them better tools to uh, to compete. Okay, great. Thank you, guys. The next question is from David McGregor with Longbow Research. Please go ahead. Good morning. Uh, it's Colton Weston for David McGregor. Thanks for taking my question. Um, so I guess to start off, given the some of the recent media coverage uh, of the new slingshot, everyone seems excited for the new auto drive transmission, uh, and I'm sure you guys are too. Uh, can you update us on the production and subsequent channel fill timeline for that new model? Yeah, we're ramping up production now. I think we'll start shipping, um, you know, early part of March. Um, and, you know, I was at the the reveal in Vegas, and there's a lot of excitement about it, and as there should be. It's a it's a really uh, refined, um, excellent, fun-to-drive vehicle. And I think, um, you know, the, the team's done a nice job, and, you know, the dealers that I've talked to are, are really excited about it. We've got, you know, we're not betting the farm on this one. It's... Uh, it's an aggressive plan, but certainly uh, something we feel like is quite reasonable given the uh, the benefits of the product and the year-over-year -year, uh, comparisons as we tried to you know exit the the LE9 uh, products throughout most of the year. So we're encouraged, but it really will be a second uh, second quarter play for us. Okay, thanks. And then just uh, follow up, speaking to the to the broader motorcycle category, um, motorcycles were up or Indian motorcycles, excuse me, were up low single digits, driven by Challenger. So I guess the progress is going well there. Um, are you? Can you say or give any detail on whether or not you believe you're taking share from other players uh, in the heavy touring category, despite it being a seasonally small quarter for motorcycles? And then also, um, are you seeing any signs of cannibalization of the Chieftain line following the Challenger intro? Yeah. Well, you remember, it's a very, very low quarter, but as we said on the call, we did take share in the fourth quarter, and we expect that to continue in um, in 2020. Um, but, yeah, it we, there's, we expected um, a little bit of cannibalization, but they're very different products. That fixed-fairing uh, liquid-cooled engine, I mean, it's a tremendous bike, but it's not for everyone. Um, and I think uh, there's still a, a good part in our portfolio for the Chieftain product, and then we expect uh, Challenger, obviously, to outperform this year as it approaches a very large segment of the market that we hadn't previously played in. Okay. Thank you so much. The next question is from Garrick Johnson with BMO Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning. Um, morning. On your, good morning. On your retail page, you showed side-by-side -side retail. Uh, the growth is coming from Ranger in general, uh, and, you, and you didn't call out the Pro XP. So, Wondering what the status of the Pro XP is, uh, the rollout of the uh, Pro XP and, and where it is and how much more you have to go and how it's performing. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you know, the consumers that have bought the Pro XP absolutely love it. They see it for the uh, the excellent performance, the refined product that it is. Um, you know, it did, as I mentioned in my prepared remarks, you know, we did – our model year 20s uh, were slightly below our ramp expectations, but improved in December. So I think the more our, our dealers and, um, you know, we're able to, to to tell people about the products, the better they feel. And I think you'll see us make um, some improvements in that Razor lineup throughout the year that should be very helpful to us. But uh, certainly, uh, as it was in the fourth quarter, you know, Ranger in general continue to be the um, the key drivers of side-by-side -side growth. But, you know, we're we're very optimistic about – the Razor portfolio as we move throughout the year. Okay, great. And then, and lastly, for me, litigation expense in in 19. I was at the high end of your guidance, and the guidance grows in 2020. So, uh, what's the outlook for litigation, and when does that um, that you know that call out start to go down? Thank you. Yeah, I mean it's it's tough to say. Um, you know, we, it's obviously public information in terms of some of the uh, the legal. Uh, cases that we're dealing with, and we obviously don't comment directly on those, but I think the, the message is we are putting the right uh, money behind it. We've got the right team, both internally and externally, in place. Uh, we feel confident in our position, and we're going to defend that. Uh, and that's, you know, we'll keep uh, the, the street status as we work through that. Okay, thank you. The Beth? next question is from Tim Condor with Wells Fargo. Please go ahead. 
Hey, gentlemen, um, just a, a couple things. I wanted to circle back on the ATV, um, uh, the 500 cc and below. Uh, what you, again? It seems like you're maybe shifting away from that segment of the market. Is that the right interpretation to have, or maybe just de-emphasizing? I guess is maybe a better way to put it. Um, and then um, from the supply chain perspective, uh, some things in the news. Unfortunately, uh, to ask the question here, but any impact from the from the uh, uh, coronavirus impact on the whole supply chain? Uh, I know it's again, it's it's only been a couple of weeks, but anything at this point that you're hearing, seeing, or or concerned about? Yeah, um, it is not correct to assume that we are de-emphasizing the the 500 and below segment. It is. Again, as I said earlier, it's the most price-sensitive part of the market. And when we did our price increases last year, that, by definition, took the biggest hit. So we had some adjustments we needed to make, um, and I think we feel comfortable with how we've navigated that. You know, we're working with our dealers to make sure that, uh, that you know, they're competitive uh, with that segment of the market. Um, you know, it, it's not going to drive profitable growth forever, but it's important for the brand and it's important for our our dealers, so uh, we feel good about where we're positioned there, but um, we're certainly not walking away. It was just the early, um, actually the first three quarters of the year, the impact of the price increases that uh, hurt us more in that segment. The Canova virus is, um, you know, something we're watching closely. We have uh, limited uh, or actually stopped travel to China right now while we sort through that. Um, you know, it's no secret that, you know, we have a, a strong team and business there, and uh, we do source some parts there, and we don't see a disruption uh, from that. It's really, uh, you know, the restrictions that they have are more on people moving, not parts moving. So we feel good about our supply chain being able to continue to uh, function smoothly. Okay. And then and then lastly, gentlemen, um, uh, granite, small quarter and so forth, uh, and then and then the Challenger launch and that, but the, the motorcycle operating loss in the quarter, anything of note there beyond those points? Yeah, so it's uh it's a couple of things, Tim. Uh one, tariffs, <clears throat> you know, we continue to have inbound uh tariffs and then, you know, obviously with uh, the ramp of uh, pole uh producing the, the retaliatory has started to come down, so that took a little bit of pressure. <laughs> Uh, off the fourth quarter. Really, the issue was, as as you well know, we had a couple of recalls that were announced both on our Indian heavyweight as well as the slingshot in the fourth quarter, and um, the heavyweight recall extended to all heavyweights. It was an easy fix, a small fix, a quick fix, but it was still substantial in terms of dollars on a relatively small quarter of, of income. And, and Mike, can you quantify the just the collective recall expense in Q4? Yeah, we haven't provided that publicly, Tim. Okay. Okay. Thank you. The next question is from Joseph Spack with RBC Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks, Scott. I was wondering if you could just talk um, a little bit about the decision to, to create the SVP of electrification. Is, is that something driven by you, that something you've seen from the consumer or, or dealer portion, something you've seen – maybe evolve with the technology, or, or is it a response to, to maybe something you've seen from some competition? It is absolutely not a response to anything. What it is is just a, a reflection of what I've learned over the last decade in this. You know, we've had a number of runs um, at the electric portfolio. And, um, you know, if you think about the power sports industry and, and how it tends to lag, it's a, a five- to ten-year lag of automotive in almost every aspect. I and mean, if you just think of what's happened there, what's happened here. And, um, you know, we feel like there's a bit of an inflection point now, not, not because of what our competitors are doing, just from what our knowledge is about how we lag the, um, the auto industry. And, you know, so we're looking at what we've got in the portfolio, and it's, it's not shabby. We have some very decent electric products in there, and our global adjacent markets has some good capability there. But if we look at the next, you know, three to five years, we know that we're going to have to be much more competitive in our core power sports market. And, um, you know, Chris's experience to help us do that was, um, was, was just too, too, really, too good to pass up. So, you know, we're already seeing in, you know, just six weeks in the, the role is uh, making good progress. And, you know, it's going to take some investments. And we want to be really, really wise and smart as we go down that path. And, um, you know, Chris is, is the perfect person to help us do that. But, you know, the board is excited about it. I'm excited about it. And I was really clear in my remarks 
This is still about adding to our profitable growth. It's not about entering into a segment where we're going to lose a bunch of money, what a lot of other people have done. Right. And, and I know you mentioned you, you've got some, some uh, interesting electric product there. Um, maybe, maybe it's too early, but um, has Chris been able to sort of give um, a, a range of, you know, investment needed over the next three to five years in order to, to you know, to achieve that profitable growth? Um, he's given us, actually, I mean, he's working very closely with, you know, Minetto and Doherty and the rest of the team. Um, we have some general ideas, and it's kind of in line with other investments we've made. It, you're, I don't think you'll see it be a, an outsized investment that spikes compared to other stuff we've done in the past. Okay. Thank you. The next question is from Mark Smith with Lake Street Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Hi, guys. Uh, first off, can you walk through or give us any breakdown on the slingshot's impact to the 2020 guidance within motorcycles? Well, it's um, it's obviously a, a big portion of the uh, double low double digit growth uh, that we indicated. You know, if you think about it, there's this whipsaw effect where we intentionally were bringing shipments down throughout 2019 as we were draining out the LE9, uh, the prior power plant uh, inventory, and trying to get the channel set up for uh, you know recharging it with the the new auto drive uh, slingshot, all new slingshot. Uh, and, and given the ASPs that we have on that, I mean, if you look at, you know, the average retail is somewhere in the uh, low 20 to high 20s, uh, that gives you a good sense that, you know, pushing that unit volume up year over year is, is obviously driving a, a decent portion of that. Now, it's not all of it. Um, you know, Challenger, uh, we anticipate, will continue to have strong growth as we head in uh, to uh, 2020, as will uh, FTR. Okay. And then last question for me, just kind of broad-based. Uh, Scott, as we look at the competitive environment, people continue to come out with, with good product and it's a competitive environment. How much of the future do you see really coming from maybe not as much product but kind of telling your story, whether it be digital, and, and how much that comes down to your new hires and, and helping kind of expand customer base and tell the story of, of who you are and what your products are? <laughs> You know, Mark, one of the things that I still love about the power sports industry is how it's just great for capitalists like me. I mean, it is a very, very competitive market, and it, it always has been, and I think it always will be, and I like betting on our team to win the competitive battle over the long term. I mean, I, I mean, it, it was not easy working through some of the, the recall issues we had and um, the tariff issues we've had, but I feel good. At, it's going to be a less – there's no drama in our plan this year. It's a pretty straightforward year. I feel really good about our ability of a team to execute. Make no mistake, we still expect to win with product. I mean, you know, whether I, I said six years ago, I told our team we're not going to win with horsepower and travel suspension forever. So it is one of those deals where we're going to make those investments. And I mean, I think you're going to be thrilled when you see the products that come out this year across the portfolio. But what we expect Vic to do and his chief digital officer role and Chris to do leading the direct electrification aspects, you know, those are going to be key contributors. And don't underestimate what's already happening with Polaris Adventures as we give people a different uh, way of, of, um, of enjoying the Polaris brand. So I think across the portfolio, you're going to see us better with customer engagement, better with safety and quality, better with our brands, um, but continuing to expect to win with product. Great. Thank you. This concludes our question and answer session. I would like to turn the conference back over to Richard Edwards for any closing remarks. Thank you, and I just want to thank everyone again for participating in the call this morning, and we look forward to talking to you again after the first quarter. Thanks again. Goodbye. The conference is now concluded. Thank you for attending today's presentation. You may now disconnect.